approach to uh, community economic development. And so we've been studying that. It uh, goes beyond the concerns of economic growth that we study, like economic development incentives and development housing tax credits and all these market-based forms of community economic development. And then we looked at sort of a localism approach, a local uh, sort of a stability approach, trying to focus on local food development and other, other aspects. Um, but this approach um, goes to considerations of how wealth, broadly defined, is used and distributed. Uh, the focus of developing the economy is to strengthen the community. Um, focuses on people, not necessarily the jobs, wealth, stability, although those are very important. Community itself is a social and economic equality, and the aim of this approach is to create more just and fair production and distribution functions within the economy. And the underlying idea is the notion of distributive justice. You guys, you know, when we talk about income inequality and have and have nots, and we study equitable, you know, development about when we do community economic development, you know, what, what are the justice implications of that? avoid gentrification and can we you know have a more just way of you know redeveloping our our communities and so today I have the pleasure to introduce to you um, two speakers who are eminent in their field of community justice community uh, organizing um, and uh, I'll just read from the uh, respective websites here so uh, all right first we have uh, Mr. Pat McCoy and uh, some of you may know, uh, how many of you had Professor Adcock? It's your husband. <laughs> That's the first, first claim. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Way back coming. <laughs> so that is. I don't know him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm <outside. laughs> yeah. So Pat is the executive director of Action NC. And Action NC's mission is to confront and reduce the root causes of poverty, underdevelopment, and social and economic inequality through grassroots education, training, organization, and mobilization. They organize in poor and working income communities full of talented and committed people looking for an opportunity to work together to build a stronger and more secure future. They reach out to them in a variety of ways to offer them the opportunity to join, organize, fight, and win. And, and with us today also is Mr. Wayne Brown, and I am going to pull up his Wikipedia page. <laughs> well, that's a shame. Yeah. <laughs> that's We're right. some out of yeah. <laughs> So, Wade is a community and labor activist who founded the Association of Community Organizations for Reform Now, ACORN, in 1970, and the Service Employees International Union, Local 100, in 1980. He was ACORN's chief organizer from its founding in 1970 until June 2, 2008, and continues to organize for the international arm. He's the publisher and editor in chief of Social Policy, a quarterly magazine for scholars and activists. The magazine publishing arm has published three of his books. Rafi and his partner Beth Butler live in New Orleans, Louisiana. And why that's important? And <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're trying to be all official here. Yeah. 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 So, anyway, just to kind of get our discussion started, and much of our reading has been focusing on the relationship between lawyers, particularly community economic development lawyers, and community organizers. Because, as we have learned, what is the fuel that motivates this approach to community economic development? Community organizing. organizing. So what would be uh, important for CED lawyers to know more about? The community. Community <laughs> organizing. Yes. And you know, so the readings that we've had have discussed more or less um, how lawyers and community organizing interact. And so we study community lawyering, which is an approach to working within communities um, which obviously, you know, sometimes comes down to, uh, you know, helping organize a campaign as opposed to filing maybe a lawsuit to uh, be able to, um, you know, achieve a community's goals. And had a very interesting article uh, by Professor Bill Quigley about the reflections of community organizers, uh, lawyering for empowerment of community organizations, and sort of uh, their experiences working in the field with lawyers. And so today we want to talk about. A, learn more about community organizing, but more importantly, how lawyers can work together with community organizers as far as we talk about issues of community justice and economic development, community development issues. So uh, why don't we just start the discussion and we'll, we'll, we'll go from there. So I'll kick off. Uh, let me just describe to you all quickly the work that Action NC does and start by saying that we formerly were North Carolina ACORN. ACORN, the group that Wade founded, worked for almost 40 years 
um, Acorn folded up in the fall of 2009 in the wake of uh, political attacks that were hard for you know, a modest nonprofit ultimately to fight against. Um, we started this new organization six months later, uh, have been at it for about five years now. We're a state-based organization. There are about 15 ex-ACORN groups that reincorporated state by state and uh, are still running today. Um, these are groups that are not formally connected to any national organization in the way that was true at ACORN, which has been in many ways a challenge for us. Uh, ACORN was really, I think, it, the biggest organization of its kind, so there were lots of there's a lot of support, there are a lot of resources available to us to do organizing on the local level, uh, development work, uh, research work, campaign support work. So we've sort of had to cobble together those resources on our own. Um, we're part of a national structure now which helps us a little bit with that, but it's really changed the nature of our work in a pretty significant way. Uh, not all for the worse. Um, it has forced us to be sort of more attentive in some ways to local and state-based issues than we were in the past because being connected to a big and relatively powerful for its kind of organization uh, group uh, at times sort of enabled us just to plug into things rather than to do some of the work on the ground ourselves to make connections in the communities where we are currently working. Um, we focus on issues of concern to sort of lower income working income families, communities, constituencies. For us in the five years we've been working, that's largely immigrant rights. We have a pretty substantial base in the undocumented community here in Charlotte and we've done a lot of work in support of comprehensive immigration reform, uh, uh, policing issues, 287G, secure community issues as regards uh, interactions with the undocumented community, the local law enforcement. Um, we fought a campaign that we got some good coverage on recently to get uh, school volunteer privileges for undocumented parents. They were not able to go into the school system and work with their children and other students because they lacked a social security number. We now have gotten uh, permission for them to go in in a supervised way uh, to do that, uh, something the parents felt very strongly about. So that's been a big part of our work. We've done a lot of tenant organizing here on the east side of Charlotte largely in buildings that are occupied mostly but not exclusively by uh, undocumented immigrants and we've used that to build a base for various purposes for organizing including our immigration reform work. So I think if you ask people in Charlotte these days, what have you heard about Action and see it really is that immigrant organizing. Uh, that, and if you read the Spanish-speaking newspapers, you would have seen a lot of sort of information about work we've been doing over the years. Um, we also have done community-based organizing uh, in the traditional way that we did it at ACORN, which is to target a geographic area and go in and ask people what their concerns are, not with any particular agenda of our own, but to find out what the problems are and sort of work with people to build a local organization that puts them in a position to address those issues, usually by taking some set of demands to city officials or private actors who are in a position to give them what they want or need to sort of improve the quality of life where they live. So when I think of community organizing, community economic development, you know, sort of my traditional way of thinking about it coming out of the experience of ACORN where I worked for more than 20 years is we often were the organization that raised hell, applied political pressure to create stronger economic, housing development, other institutions in the communities where we worked because it was important that if we waged campaigns over time to improve housing, to improve job training programs, whatever it is, that you know, over time you had to deliver something in those communities for people to want to continue to be involved. And often the way to do that was to sort of help create these institutions that you all were studying in this course and that lawyers can be very helpful uh, in putting together and in some instances protecting um, if it comes to that. So we also work on health care access. We're very involved in helping pass the Affordable Care Act, implementing it thereafter. We're fighting for Medicaid expansion here in the state. 
um, state budget and tax issues we organized around. We uh, are involved in the campaign now, sort of a women's equality campaign to reach out to what we call the rising American electorate, uh, single women, people of color, and millennials, 18 to 30 year olds, to increase sort of their participation in elections, as you all read, uh, the overall turnout in this country in the 2014 election was the lowest it had been since World War II. This is an enormous problem for our constituency because whatever gains we make politically in national elections during the big presidential years, we tend to lose two years later. And you know, in the end, what we're about is building political power by uh, base building, getting enough people engaged in these campaigns that we can be taken seriously by people in positions of authority and also leadership development, really working with people who usually have not been involved in the political process, helping them develop skills, develop perspective, where they can sit across the table from someone on the city council uh, or someone on the county commission or someone who is sort of hurting their communities through bad lending practices, who hangs out in one of these big bank towers, can sit across the table and feel confident that they can press a set of demands and be persistent enough, smart enough, strategic enough that over time, we can win at least part of what we're going for there. But, uh, you know, we're people who believe in a very different world from the one we live in. And uh, it takes a sense of humor. It takes a long-term vision to be an organizer. Um, certainly what we win is always only a small part of the way we would like to see things happen. But certainly if you look around Charlotte, for instance, a lot of the good things that have happened in Charlotte over the last 20 to 30 years relate to the work that you all are studying about. We developed a pretty, uh, strong set of community institutions here in Charlotte that work in lower income neighborhoods and help out in these ways, economic development, housing development, and uh, certainly hasn't made as much of a difference as we're looking for, but uh, Charlotte is one of those cities that has taken this seriously. And uh, when you look at it, Greer Heights, communities which are still beleaguered in many ways, uh, at the same time, good things have happened largely through organizing efforts that people took on here in Charlotte before we ever came to town. Uh, so that's a few things, um, maybe a good enough place to start. We uh, have worked with lawyers, I'll just say, uh, Rocky uh, and a couple of students helped us out with some tenant organizing work we were doing, uh, very, very helpfully so. Um, a couple of apartment organizing drives we were involved in where we were meeting resistance from the management about whether or not we could even get access to the properties. Um, so they helped out there. Uh, Jason Huber has been helpful. Uh, through the Civil Rights Clinic uh, on the Ban the Box campaign, you know, which is to get the sort of if you have a prior felony conviction question taken off of job applications for city employees. We won that campaign, respective city employees. Um, we also were part of a coalition to uh, reform the Citizens Review Board here in Charlotte, which was a successful campaign uh, that we won early in 2014. And a lot of those people who are engaged, were engaged in that are now involved in the sort of fight here locally to create an anti-racial profiling ordinance uh, for Charlotte law enforcement. And we're also pushing a bill at the legislature to do the same, which given the composition of the North Carolina legislature uh, is probably so much wishful thinking, but obviously this is an important political moment, as you all understand, to sort of press these demands and to you know, suggest specific solutions legal solutions to these problems that over time would make a difference in the way sort of the community and the police interact. So there's a few things we're up to. I'll turn it over to Wayne. He has, he ran a big national organization, I think, has had a, a lot of dealings with lawyers over the years on these kinds of issues, and I'm sure has something to say about that. Certainly I've been sued. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if, that's, if that's what that means. Uh, I've uh, often needed lawyers, and we had in-house lawyers, and in ACORN because it was just cheaper to sort of breed and train our own than it was to go out into the market. But briefly, ACORN International, as Rocky said, works in about 20 countries. We have about 150,000 members. The largest affiliate is in Canada, but we also work uh, extensively in Latin America, um, Honduras, Argentina, Mexico, et cetera, uh, Peru, Ecuador. Uh, our Largest projects outside of uh, Canada are in India. We have a, a 
a union of hawkers, street sellers, uh, informal workers in, out of Bengaluru with 35,000 members and growing rapidly uh, in Chennai and elsewhere. Um, we work particularly in mega slums around the world. Uh, on the towns outside of Buenos Aires, uh, San, San Juan uh, Lurigancho outside of Lima, Peru, uh, very low income. The issues are uh, land title for squatters, potable water, basic city services that are one. We are a membership organization, as ACORN was. People pay dues uh, to support the organization. Um, it operates like a union in the community, if you will. Um, and uh, that's worked for us over the years because it's created a highly loyal, sustainable, and active membership base, which uh, makes it obviously a pleasure to organize to see the development of leadership and people who uh, take those values every day into the work. Um, but means that you're often uh, in situations where when you do have a legal issue, you're looking for friends and help and anybody who can give you advice, um, usually on a pro bono way. Even when we had within ACORN in the US, um, our own legal department, our lawyers were more like legal organizers in the sense that uh, we had state organizations in 38 different states in the country and if there was a legal problem, in Denver and the lawyers were located in New Orleans, they would reach out to friends or people who were in that legal community or might be part of the Lawyers Guild or Liscrit or um, any number of groups who could say, okay, we've got a problem. Somebody was just arrested in a demonstration about housing rights here and can you help us, uh, you know, work this situation out. In other cases, we were trying to uh, make law as, as Pat was describing some of the action in C or an ACORN work, we're often at the point where we're trying to create new policies, new programs, new initiatives, and uh, sometimes we're using what we call an organizing a handle, a small piece that seems to be, if you pushed it and breathed on it hard and expanded it and inflated it, might change and open up an opportunity for an entitlement or a new policy or a new position or some advancement. Um, it was nice to hear Rocky's introduction because anytime when the question, the answer to every question is community organizing, I think we could go back to school and go, okay, Pat. I mean, if the answer to the first two questions, community organizing, I thought, oh, I could pass it. I could be a lawyer too, as opposed to practicing law without a license, as I have done for 50 years or so. <laughs> but, uh, I can remember in the early 70s when I first went to New York to try to raise money for ACORN and uh, head of a foundation called the New World Foundation at that point asked me when we were going to get tired of this community organizing thing and get serious and get into community development. And uh, so it's nice to see over the decades that that was in the wake of huge federal programs, OEO, Model Cities, and other things uh, that have now been subscribed to a very small footprint of what they once were when there was actually a war on poverty and crazy things like that. Um, but there was a thought that you could do economic development, community economic development, that would trickle down and create mass change for people. Uh, unfortunately, for the most part, that vehicle, community development corporations, has not produced uh, in those ways. And a, a, uh, Pathbreaking study a couple of years ago uh, from uh, David Rusk, uh, the former mayor of Albuquerque, uh, on a Ford Foundation contract, looked at 50 different, the largest 50 uh, community development corporations in the country. And only one, if you looked at the analytics of the community, could show that there was actually economic progress in terms of higher income, better residential space. And that was in the sort of Tri-Rivers area of Cincinnati because it was gentrified. So the notion that what's happened to some lower income, mixed racial communities in terms of community development decoupled from community organization, which involves empowerment, could create economic change, turns out to be largely through gentrification. Um, and that's not exactly a win for our people. That means for lower, moderate income families, which is where ACORN and a Action and NC have always focused, means displacement. Um, farther out, living in suburbs, living in 
uh, mass tenancy situations, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It was uh, delightful to read your paperwork, and I finally got to see Bill Quigley's piece. I'd never seen that, so I, I see that, you know, what, 20 yeah. years ago or something? I, you know, yeah, I hate to have to own right. everything yeah. I said 20 yeah. years ago. Yeah, I was actually you know, in a law review. So. <laughs> <laughs> now I really will be practicing law without a license. Hey, I can cite I mean, Didn't you read the Toledo <laughs> Law Review or something? You know, I, but um, we used to train lawyers, and, and it gave some of this sense in the paper you read, but basically, uh, <laughs> it was an interesting. We would teach them first how to use a mimeograph machine. Uh, we would take them out on the door. We thought it was important for them not to just have that legal background, but to have an organizing background. And the partly you the reason... You might tell them what a mimeograph machine yes. actually is. <laughs> well, before there were Xerox machines, <laughs> there were these things that, you know, involved ink and paper, and you, you know... You remember your elementary school days? Some of you had these little things that they would go into... None of you have any idea what I'm talking about. Thank you, sister. Oh, my God. Oh, jeez. You know, I was telling Pat earlier today, I mean, part of how we, we finance our organizing in Latin America is we run a couple of fair trade coffee houses in New Orleans. And I often say every time I walk into one of these coffee houses, the hip quotient goes down about 50%. And, um, that may be, well, maybe a graph machine, let's call them a Xerox machine. So, you know, we teach them how to use the Xerox machine. Okay. Um, but uh, the point being that they had to understand how the sort of the nuts and bolts worked of community organizing, particularly in a membership organization where democratic principles prevail. Um, and I could give you a perfect example of how that sort of community lawyering worked in an ACORN context as composed to how you find it in most of the world. And that would have to do with how you set up a simple thing like a corporation for a community organization. Now, if you were, if a community group walked into you as a new lawyer, 99 out of a, or 999 out of a thousand lawyers would immediately tell people that what they needed to do was incorporate. And furthermore, besides incorporating, what they would need to do is file for a 501c3 IRS tax exemption. Now, those are actually very value-laden decisions that an attorney of goodwill would almost in a knee-jerk way advise community organizations and almost anybody to do. And let me tell you why that would be so dangerous and why it actually subsumes the decision-making ability of both the staff and membership of those organizations. Coming out of a different organizing tradition, ACORN began in 1970, June 18th of 1970, we didn't actually incorporate it all until 1978, eight years later. Well, why would I have been so crazy? I look at least as competent as the average bear. Why didn't I immediately incorporate? Well, in the tradition coming out of the civil rights movement and the labor movement, there are two things that you need to know. One is that labor unions are not incorporated. They are what is called unincorporated associations of groups. That's a legal status as you would know. And the part of the reason, and that's the second reason we never did, is that if you're involved in direct action in civil disobedience, if you're incorporated, any injunction taken out by civil authorities blocks the activity of the entire organization. If you're unincorporated as an association of groups, you have to name every individual. So you might, if you wanted to stop ACORN in 1973 from sitting in at the Housing Authority in Little Rock or the Welfare Office with our unruly welfare recipients, you would have had to take out that injunction and name, you could name the top leaders, you could name Wade Rafke as the, the chief organizer, but the next day, Another 500 people could show up, couldn't they? Well, coming out of the, the history of the 1960s, and I started out as a welfare rights organizer before I organized ACORN, in Massachusetts in 1969 and 70, when I was running a mass welfare rights organization, we had 327 arrests that year that were involved in various demands and actions on welfare authorities to try to get something better for welfare recipients. 
So we were very tentative. It wasn't until we started expanding around the country where we had to have more liability protection, which is why we created the corporation. And then the other thing I mentioned was this whole thing about being a 501c3. Why would you want a 501c3? Do you know what that status is? Tax exempt. <coughs> Tax exempt. Okay, so what are the advantages of it? You're saving money. And then your less money you have to pay on property. People that contribute to your uh, organization also get a tax break. Right. But who is benefited by that tax break if you're a membership organization? If you're paying Acorn dues in Canada is fifteen dollars a month and in the US when it went under it was ten dollars a month. Would they get a if you had a five oh one C three, would you get a tax exemption on a hundred and twenty dollars a month? Or one hundred and twenty dollars a year? You're saying no, and why is that? It's because there are five one C three status only governs us here in America. It only governs us here, but furthermore, um, you have to have enough income to itemize your taxes. If any of you file personal taxes, you've got to be. I'm not saying you're a one percenter, but you've got to make some big money to bother with itemizing. So, and membership dues. And unions are business expense, but they're not tax deductible. You can handle them, and to the degree you're improving your, I mean, so that's not the reason you'd get a 501c3 if you wanted a tax exemption for a, a new organization. So why would you do that? Yet it's standard advice to everybody. And if you are tax exempt, there aren't there some things you cannot do? And what would those be? Certain political lobbying, depending on your nature of your tax exempt, but you may be prohibited from engaging in political lobbying activities, which would certainly be conducive to organizing. Damn right. Um, so, yeah, you can't get involved in politics. And in fact, it's even more chilling than that because people will often cite that grassroots lobbying, which has been pushed ever since the Reagan administration as the bugaboo within the 501c3 means that even if you're a 501c3 and you wanted to, let's say the North Carolina legislature said, come and talk to us about community development, you've got to be very careful when you go up there, even if you're invited by a committee of your August body to go up and testify that that's not grassroots lobbying. If it is grassroots lobbying, it's not more than a certain percentage of what your budget is. But you know, it's an interesting thing. And as lawyers, you would be intrigued to know this or to find this out. You'd want to know what the what percentage to recommend to your organizational clients they couldn't go past, wouldn't you? Right. Now, for all these years that they have chilled 501c3 political activity, there is no IRS standard for what level of your budget. So it depends on how conservative the institution. If you've got money from a foundation, and they said, well, you better not spend more than 15% or 8%. They're all, but there is no settled question here. The IRS has never done a case. There's never been a determination about what is too much on grassroots lobbying or what is too little. So basically you have people self-enforcing and restricting their own political activity, even if they're a 501c3. So once again, I'm back to the question, why would you ever want a community-based organization to be a 501c3? Well, obviously ACORN was not a 501c3. Well, you might say, well, were you a 501c4? Well, that... I have no idea why a 501c3 501c4 is good for anything. Because all we ever were was a plain vanilla nonprofit. And what's what does a nonprofit mean? Organization that engages in different aspects of communities, uh, you can talk about charities and so forth. And how is it different than a for profit? Well, you have shareholders that Precisely. It's a shareholder question. You cannot divide the assets among shareholders. Now, in about 20 different states in the country, you can have a stock-based nonprofit, which is interesting. And we used to have a lot of those. All of our building corporations were stock-based nonprofits. We had to incorporate each building for liability purposes as a nonprofit, but it was stock-based in the sense that if the tenants included a radio station of ours, or ACORN, or one of our unions, or whatever, or our housing corporation, each one of them had a share and was on the board, but 
there was no distribution of income. So all a nonprofit is, as opposed to a for-profit, is something that's restricted in how it distributes any excess income. A nonprofit plows its income back into the developing the organization. A for-profit can give it out to, you know, whoever the boss is, or whoever the investors are, whoever the owner is. So being a nonprofit, gives you all the benefits, what advantage would you get from a C4? It's more relaxed on the political activity that you can engage in. But it still has restrictions and very little benefits. I mean, so the real truth is, once you advise an organization to be a C4 or C3, you're already, you're already making, as a lawyer potentially, a very fundamental organizational mission decision forever in that organization. And believe me, I am the voice in the wilderness on this. But I get invited to talk to so few emerging lawyers, I could not resist this opportunity to plant the seeds of revolution right here in Charlotte. Well, it might be worth pointing out that the political pressure, if that's the right way to put it, from funders, for instance, to create a C4 structure, if in fact you operate that way, is considerable. And you have to be able, if you're going to build an organization, to say no. I'm going to just jump in right here from yeah. the Quigley article, because I just want to play upon this. Uh, he has a quote here, and I think one of the things we're studying, obviously, is the role of lawyers. You know, I mean, in law school, professionalism, understanding our role. And some of the tension between, obviously, raising hell to try to change the system, and our role as institutional like, guardians of the court. You know, we, we do take an oath when he's licensed. It's like, we defend the Constitution, and we're officers of the court, you know. Um, so here's a quote, I think, uh, and maybe this we could kind of maybe chew on this, this quote here is, therefore, confronting the system or raising hell makes the lawyer very uncomfortable uh, because it is not how the lawyer was trained to deal with the system. And the lawyer, without realizing it, is challenged individually because the lawyer is part of the system. So... I, I kind of maybe, you know, as, as we have been studying here and as you start to develop your understanding of your role as a lawyer in professionalism, um, how, you know, maybe we can kind of like maybe explore this tension a little bit between, because um, obviously, you know, you know, if you're unorganized, I mean, you're not incorporated and you have a mission of, you know, like organization, I mean, you can uh, perform acts of civil disobedience. But, you know, there, I mean, there's a lot of literature. You can as a nonprofit, too. Mm -hmm. You can as a nonprofit as well. Yeah. So really, I just want to just kind of get maybe some thoughts about you know being a lawyer and working in communities, and you know um, does, does this does this quote ring true to you? Do you feel uncomfortable thinking about running a campaign, or I mean not running a campaign, working in community with a community-based campaign um, to change the system? Yeah, go ahead. We're here to discuss. I, I would. Um, when I was reading the Furby article, it said that usually it, um, legal disputes in courts usually doesn't really solve the problems that these nonprofits have, and then attorneys have to go in there and be these problem-solving uh, leaders, and these are aspects, I guess, that you learn outside the real world, tricks and tactics that probably you wouldn't figure out until experience. So these are the types of problems that, that I think, because we're very one-dimensional as we're taught. Just law, go in there, litigate, and be very, very cautious, defensive. And usually people have to be on the offense when it comes to these issues. That's what I think. Well, um, to piggyback off of that, I guess, what would a lawyer do to retrain itself? Did you come from the litigator side? And you, and we got rules of professional conduct that we must follow. We can't do certain things. And one of the things says is, some call a gonzo law or something like that, where you file a lawsuit that you're not really trying to win. And so I'm thinking is it's kind of close to being a frivolous lawsuit. How would somebody balance that? Because we have rules we can't really file frivolous lawsuits, but we're filing a lawsuit with the end game not to win, but to just keep it in the public eye. Like, how will you finesse that as a new lawyer? Well, you know, it's an interesting story that was in the papers yesterday about the suit by AIG against the federal government around her bailout. Everybody thinks this guy is a crazy man who was the primary investor because after getting all these tens and gazillions of billions of dollars to AIG to bail it out, 
He then sued, saying that the government took advantage of the company, and they lost $8 billion for that. And so he got this lawyer, David Boyce, who's a very famous litigator now. <laughs> Only cost, I don't know, $1,500 an hour is what they quoted in the paper, but I don't know. I don't know, because I'm not, I'm not his accountant. <laughs> and so, but all the, the other lawyers were saying, this guy's suit was essentially frivolous. He didn't have a chance. How can you, there's nobody who lost money, so where's the harm? And all of a sudden, David Boyce seems to have handled the case in such a way that he had the government witnesses tripping on each other, including Benadike, who was the head of the Federal Reserve and the former head of the Treasury Department, that in fact maybe they were dealt with in a slightly discriminatory fashion. So I say all that to say this, you know, a frivolous lawsuit is very rare. There are so many lawsuits that are out there, I don't know, you could probably classify half of them as frivolous, frankly, but I think very few people actually stand to the bar and have to answer for a frivolous lawsuit. A frivolous lawsuit is also determined by how you defend it and how you proceed it. And I think whether it's AIG or a little community group or an ACORN, giving people good representation, and that's all I'm talking about is I think you have a burden as you join the priesthood of law now in this country to give people all the options. And sometimes you have to know Maybe it's not real world experience, but sometimes it is. Little things like incorporating or not incorporating, being tax exempt or not being tax exempt, are actually decisions you should allow people to make. I mean, your relationship is to a client in their best interest. And I guess what I'm encouraging you as you maybe get involved in this field is you be very careful to give the full options because they aren't as simple as, yes, you should incorporate, yes, you should be tax exempt because you may be inadvertently directing the, I mean in organizing we often say that the beginnings prejudice the ends. We don't say the ends justify the means. We say how things start often determines how they develop. And nothing is more true than the actual foundational formation of the organization. Because if you all of a sudden from this can never be involved in politics, but you've made a decision forever. That organization will never be able to be in a campaign that crosses a line that's political. The, the opposite decision, and at some peril, as, Paul, as uh, Pat says in 2010, Marie under after, after, after almost 40 years, is we decided we would be political. So, you know, we courted the storm, if you will, 40 years later, but it also allowed us to win everything we won for all those years. And, uh, the legacy of that organization, whether it's in North Carolina or the work I still do every day, is long. So, um, most of the organizations you deal with will never make it past three years. I mean, the death rate for community organizations tends to be ad hoc, they're campaign based, and they're difficult to sustain. Uh, but once again, you deal with them as institutions. These are very fragile institutions which have to have a chance to succeed. You know, Acorn's biggest sin was registering lower income people of color to vote in urban areas. And lots of them. And lots of them. Yeah, and that's what made us a big target for partisans who uh, would rather not see people turn out to vote, as has been evidenced here in this state by the voter suppression laws we've passed, as many other states have over the last few years, which is well, we're one of the organizations that's working on that issue. With some success, you'll probably solve it redistricting cases coming back from the U.S. Supreme Court to the North Carolina Supreme Court it doesn't mean we'll win, but it is encouraging that somebody's taking that very extreme racial gerrymandering seriously, because it's a disenfranchisement strategy. Pure and simple. Uh, you know, I think one of the things that ratings brings out very well is that sort of tension, you have a duty of zealous representation of a lawyer to your client. Uh, doesn't mean you necessarily agree with what they're doing, of course, but if you take them on, you know, you're there to go to the map for them in every way that as a lawyer you feel that you ethically and legally can do. Uh, I think about frivolous lawsuits, it is true that lawyers very rarely get Rule 11 for the suits they bring, very rarely are cost imposed on people. You know, we are a very sort of litigation um, friendly um, society in the way that we allow the legal system to operate, as opposed to, you know, other countries where if you bring a suit and lose, you wind up having to pay the cost for it. We just operate for a different manner. 
I do think the question of who are your clients, really, when you represent a community organization, is something, again, the readings bring out very effectively. I can think of a couple of instances. I can't say a lot of details about one, but in ACORN, one of our most effective campaigns, uh, back when urban blight was just, was just, you know, go to North Philadelphia, there were 30,000 abandoned homes within an area of about four square miles. It was just it was a war zone back in the early 80s. And so we mounted a campaign there. We did it successfully in Brooklyn as well. So House for a Dollar squatters campaign. There are a lot of legal issues, of course, when people from the community literally break the lock off an abandoned house and go inside and reclaim it for the community. And we did a lot of that as a way to put pressure on cities then to create House for a Dollar programs so that through sweat equity, people could begin at least to redevelop some of the homes in these devastated communities. Um, I know in Brooklyn, again, I don't want to, you might remember this better way, there, a really intense conflict came up at some point during the campaign, and the tension was between people who had occupied these homes, who wanted to get the deeds to those houses, were encouraged to do so, and the ends of the campaign to keep the pressure on in order to get the city to adopt the program, which would make it possible for a lot more homes to be taken over and rehabilitated. And it, you know, and I think the lawyers, we had legal services lawyers from Philadelphia who were great, were put in a difficult situation. This is in Brooklyn, I'm sorry, but also working there. They were put in a difficult situation because there's a question of, do we help these people who want these houses? Or do we sort of stay true to the goals of this campaign, which is to do something that will benefit the broader community? And I honestly don't remember how it got resolved, other I think in the end. Well, the lawyers work for the organization. That's how it got resolved. Yeah. But people get confused whether or not they're representing some individual who may be part of the name plaintiffs in a case or the organization who is also there. But as you know, sometimes it's easier to get standing for an individual than it is for the organization. It depends on the local, you know, judicial practice in that, that area. So in some cases, we were able to get ACORN and then individually named plaintiffs. And in some cases, ACORN would have to get, you know, Pat and Rocky and, you know, some of you and y'all were there and we're having to do the rest. So, um, but the lawyers, we would always be clear, worked through the democratic channel of the membership organization and the board and, and those kinds of things. That's difficult, but that's a very good point. And, uh, Here's another example, and it's in an unrelated area, but something that I've worked on a lot myself, and uh, I've been involved working on uh, death penalty litigation on the defense side after graduating from law school myself up in Boston and doing that work here in North Carolina. Um, and y'all might remember in 2010 we passed something that's called the Racial Justice Act, and this was an opportunity through our courts to bring a further claim uh, that if considered worthy would give a chance for another court review, state court review, of claims that racial bias played a role in the imposition of the death sentence. And one of the reasons we were really interested in winning a Racial Justice Act was one of the prosecution strategies in death cases in this state has often been, as is true in many places, to pack juries with people who are not of color. Because it's just statistically true that people of color, knowing how the sort of judicial, the justice system has worked in their communities, are often less inclined to impose a death sentence. Uh, and that's true for white defendants as well as defendants of color. So the Racial Justice Act was a chance to bring a claim that was not available under state and federal law at that time, so-called Batson claim about jury selection, um, to bring a claim that racial bias played a part in the composition of that jury. And then, of course, you go through all the voir dire process. And it wasn't hard in a lot of these cases to come up you know, with prosecution asking questions and excluding people for reasons that clearly had nothing to do with anything other than the fact that they were people of color. So it was actually a very powerful tool, potentially, to sort of 
further undermine the imposition of capital punishment here in the state, which many of us were involved politically as well as legally in challenging and still are to this day. Um, the, the tension sort of after the Racial Justice Act was passed, it was only the second state in the country that had passed one, and ours was considerably stronger than the one that Kentucky had passed. So we were all very thrilled that it had gone through. Um, but among people who sort of operate at the highest level of litigators here in the state, we have some great lawyers who have done death penalty work over the years, attention arose very immediately about bringing claims for guys sitting on death row. I say guys, there are only two women on death row in North Carolina right now, one of whom is Cindy's client. Um, bringing um, claims, Racial Justice Act claims for everybody on the row, both white defendants as well as black defendants or Latino defendants. Um, people knew politically that if white guys on death row brought a Racial Justice Act claim saying that they were discriminated against as white defendants by racial bias and jury composition, that the legislature would use that as a reason to repeal the Racial Justice Act, which they, in fact, did. And, but as lawyers, and some of the lawyers who brought these claims were white defendants are very good, as much opposed to the death penalty as anybody else, but they argued, as lawyers, we have a duty to our client to bring every claim that we possibly can that might benefit our client. And we would be shirking our professional responsibility if we did not bring their claims on their behalf. And there were other lawyers, some of whom have white clients themselves. And this is a very, very serious point of contention among, sort of again, the highest levels of the capital defense bar here in the state about whether or not bringing these cases would inevitably lead to the repeal of the Racial Justice Act, given the fact that after 2010, the composition, as you all know, of the North Carolina legislature changed dramatically. And everybody knew that if it came back up for a vote, it would be repealed, which it did. But again, it's, you know, it's, it's this question without a very clear answer, right? Uh, and really talented lawyers, people who were very committed to the larger cause, fell down on opposite sides of what was the best strategy to pursue. So again, unrelated, dramatic, I think it really points to the tensions. As a lawyer, you can feel when you're representing a cause, and a whole class of people or feel that you are, but at the same time, you've got a client whose case you really feel that you need to push on in every way you can. So. so my question to you guys, like hearing you guys talk about how, you know, becoming an attorney is it's a burden that we must take, especially if we're interested in community organizing and ensuring that social justice is, you know, actually assured. But like my colleagues mentioned, when you come to law school, prior to coming to law school, you may have had the sense of, you know, the law is what's going to make this change, and so I'm going to become an attorney, and I'm going to use the law to make that change. But then as you go through your training, you start learning about these rules and these duties and these responsibilities, and so you do tend to, I guess, draw back in fear of, okay, I, I came to get this degree to make that change, but then I'm going to lose this, this degree if I really go forth and make that change. And the Purdue article talked about various models um, that the legal field brings up as to what those solutions might be in terms of utilizing the law to create social justice. So as you guys, as community organizers, I'm just curious to, to know, like, what do you guys see as some of the solutions that we can use? Because I think attorneys are essential part of the social justice piece, and community organizers are obviously the main part. But how do we unite the two together where an attorney can really go out there, help that community organizer bring social justice without having that conflict of, you know, going against the very, like Chris Grant talked about, put my hand on the Bible and said I'm going to protect and defend the law, but then I'm fighting this law. The, uh, you know, luckily the answer to every hard question earlier was community organization. So, um, I, but, and even on Pat's very difficult example, I mean, there's a problem where you're representing individuals, not an organization. And so I guess one of the things that I think is helpful in this that, that does align professional obligations for lawyers as well as desperate needs for low and moderate income families are getting legal assistance. Um, and to use an organizational vehicle is so much easier than trying to mount claims for individuals because uh, an individual 
is always under, um, I mean, Pat can talk about the organizational pressure, let's say, that funders put on a, a C4, uh, on an organization to become a C4, even though it's, you know, there's no relevant reason legally Maybe. that I know of. But, Maybe. Yeah. but, you know, they have a gun to their head because there's money behind it. Well, you can imagine if you're a low income client, and, you know, a perfect example is a campaign that Pat and I are actually talking about over these couple of days I'm in town. It has to do with new rules because of the Affordable Care Act that deal with nonprofit hospitals. And it's part of a bigger theme that I, I talk about as citizen wealth or income security that um, the level of almost incomprehensible bureaucracy that's coming into modern life allows huge opportunities for legal assistance and legal intervention, I would say, based simply on getting people to follow the law. So here's, here's the handle that we're looking at. Under the Affordable Care Act, and it's enforced January 1, 16, people have to have, every nonprofit hospital has to be clear, finally, transparent, and aggressive in informing low-income patients of the charitable responsibilities a nonprofit has because they are a 501c3 to provide charity care for low-income people who do not have the finances to pay for their care. So and the penalty starting in 2016, the IRS has to do a, an assessment every two years on whether or not that nonprofit hospital is actually providing charitable care in adequate enough resources to justify their 501c3 tax exemption, or should they go ahead and be a profit hospital? Which the 501c3 saves hospitals billions of dollars. Boku, yeah. Boku share. I mean, it's just like out of control. So, and that's why they're all consolidating, like, you know, everywhere and buying up each other and all these kinds of things under the Affordable Care Act. So he, right now, almost 50% of the credit blemishes that a low-income family, any family, has at the credit bureau are, are med medically related health. And you can look at some of those things, and the average is chunk change, it's between $200 and $300. So you're not talking about $100,000 bills. Sure, you know, nobody can pay, and they're going to mess up your credit, and let's call, that a, let's call that a wash. We're talking about, you know, some bill maybe you didn't even know you were getting in a hospital, or some they pulled in some expert for you know a coffee and they charged you ten grand. You know you don't know. But the bills will have to be transparent, and under the new act, they can't. At ninety days, they'll have to give every patient, including low-income patients, notice that you're only thirty days before they'll put something on there. And if you challenge as a patient, as a client, potentially for y'all and for us whether or not that bill was justified, whether or not the bill was broken down, whether or not you understood the bill, whether or not they showed you the policy, you then have another three months before they can do anything to you. So you have what's going to, in essence, be an individualized grievance procedure in terms of, as we see it as organizers, that you can push in terms of what the rule is, what best practices on the rule are, how you can be advocates for those individuals. And some of it is as simple, we, we've in uh, Arkansas, Louisiana, and Texas, we've set up these things called citizen wealth centers, and we use a lot of volunteer lawyers to help us. But it's often as simple as somebody will get a bill, they're on Medicare, for God's sakes, they'll get a $13,000 bill from some nonprofit. And all the bill will say is $13,000 at the bottom. It won't say, it won't be broken down like a, you know, a grocery store or street where you actually can say, hey, I bought this six pack or this, you know, a bunch of hot dogs or whatever. It's just $13,000, please pay now. Here's, can you have a credit card? And so just literally by reaching out <laughs> to the hospital, all of a sudden, when I'm in Arkansas just the other day, wiped away everything but $1,300 of the bill. I mean, because, in fact, if you're on Medicare, you shouldn't be paying anything more. But often they go the full-scale the the full scale charges until you challenge it. So some people might have ended it up. My point is, we're going to have in healthcare, and that's part of what we're talking to. We're talking to a reporter tomorrow who's done a story about it. We've had some volunteer lawyers doing some research about it. And part of my volunteer army of, you know, people are looking at this. But... This is going to be huge. And Social Security, same thing. Somebody recently put out a book that's now a bestseller. It's like 300 pages on 
Do you understand Social Security? Nobody understands Social Security anymore. Nobody, nobody gets it. Um, and you know, they can even do things like uh, try to collect from your estate once you die for your Medicare payments. I mean, well, well, what are we talking about here? So my point is we, have, we actually have the ability to change what people's basic citizen wealth is, what their basic income is for lower income people if we have enough organizations and lawyers to force people to follow the law and to actually understand. I know it's boring to talk, I mean, you may see yourself on the front pages winning the class action suit, you know, John Edwards coming back to life or something. But <laughs> the real truth is we love John Edwards, man. And I can't believe what happened to that dude. But, um, <laughs> He was for us. I mean, we live in wages. He was with us all the way, man. We were ready to go with him, but we with Obama. Um, thank God. Um, but anyway, my point is this boring thing, administrative law or whatever you call it, there's billions of dollars, billions and billions of dollars for low-income people right there just by bothering to read the manuals. I'm not talking about you know, libraries with law books. I'm talking about the basic manuals, the basic rules of procedures, being able to set up systems that allow people to represent themselves, to get help from others, to, you know, we think this could be huge. 